all of the material in the workshop is organized as, as our studio projects. And this is why we were so adamant about actually getting the pre-work done, because uh, you'll need to download a, an RStudio project to get started. The project we'll initially work with is Here, so um, HTTPS GitHub.com, Hugen, and our intro. So, what you need to do, as you know, to um, load such a project is uh, you go to File, New Project. Um, yeah. What am I going to do here? Um, so you go to File, New Project, open a new project under Version Control with Git, type this address, and put the project folder into your course folder. So in your pre-work, you've already done the very same thing with, um, with an introductory project. This is, our intro is the one we need for this workshop and course. When you are done with that, um, kindly put a blue post-it on your laptop. If it didn't work, wave your hand or put a red post-it. On your laptop. If it didn't work, wave your hand or put a red post-it. I see some blue post-its. Okay, let's go around. No, 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 no. Go to our studio. Don't go to that site in Croke. Uh, you need it for uh, opening the project in our studio. Um, Thank you. 
Most of us use Mac computers. Lauren is our resident Windows expert. <laughs> Windows scares me. Um, all right. So if the project has started, um, the first thing I'd like you to do is, as the startup screen probably said when you launched the project, is to type in it. Now, I've typed this in this pane up here, the top uh, left pane. And I've hit return, and of course nothing happened. Um, if I want to execute this function, what do I need to do? Control enter. Either control enter. That will execute things from the script pane. Or type in it into the lower left pane, which is the console. So if I type it into the console, I just hit return. If I type it into up here, I hit control enter or on the Mac command enter. <coughs> And this will run a little script which will initialize two functions and probably create two files. Um, that are uh, files that are called uh, my intro notes, my sequence analysis, and my, um, my data integration. So let's have a brief, first of all, let's check whether everything is set up correctly. Your project folder contains all the files that you see on the right-hand side, on the lower left in the file menu. But R also has a concept of a working directory, i.e., by default, all the files that you're looking for or all the files that you want to load or work with are in this working directory. So let's check whether the files that you see in the file pane on the lower right-hand side are actually the files in your working directory. Do you remember how to get the working directory listed in R? Right, there's an R command, get wd. And this displays a string of where on my computer the current working directory is. And this also happens to be the directory that I know where this is installed. But I can check and make sure that this is correct by figuring out what the actual directory listing is. And that's a command to list files. Did did we cover that command in, yes. and the command is? List files. List files, get files. I can't remember. List? list? Okay, so I type list, ah. And this pops up, once I, once I type three characters, it gives me a, a choice of different commands that, that start with this. So I do indeed need list files. 
and I can either tab or click on that, and it brings up the command. Now, <coughs> list files is a function. All our functions are followed by parentheses, and I can um, put things into the parentheses. These are the parameters to the function. That's what I want the function to work on. The parameters a function like list files could expect is, for example, a directory what I want files listed in. But if I don't put in parameters, the functions usually have default behavior. The default behavior here is to get the files from the working directory. So when I execute this, I get a listing of the files um, that is approximately equivalent to the listing that I get on in, in the files pane. There's one difference. Do you notice the difference? Behind some, some files. Like yeah. Some them. files are hidden. So list files, like normally the directory functions in your operating system, Windows or Mac, doesn't show the so-called hidden files. The hidden files are files that start with a period, with a dot at the beginning. Your files pane graciously shows us all the files that exist, and that's really important. But list files by default omits the files that start with a dot. And these files have some special behavior. Um, for example, our profile in your working directory, if it's a project directory, is a file that is automatically loaded when R starts. So for example, our profile here is this little file that defines a function and then um, prints out some strings, welcome, and type in it to set up the session. Okay, now <clears throat> the way we're going to proceed in this workshop is um, to practice mostly principles of development. In the five minutes preceding, I've mentioned five or six different R functions and R commands, and there are hundreds by default. And there are thousands if you include all the special commands that get loaded from packages, and they're literally thousands of packages that extend R's functionality. It's impossible to keep track with everything that happens in the R world. Th so that's not the way you do it. The, the way you work with R is not to try to memorize all the different functions. The way we, you work with R is to adopt sound principles of solving problems. Taking a problem, breaking it down step by step, systematically, and then going through the steps individually and figuring out, well, how do I express this in computer code? How do I express this specifically in R code? The way that I teach this is actually something of a subset <coughs> of R, not using all of the R functions that we could use to make maximally efficient and, and uh, maximally concise R code, but it's kind of a somewhat pedestrian way of doing things for several reasons. One of the reasons is if we take things and rather than using functions that do everything in one expression, but rather do it step by step, it's much easier to troubleshoot and to verify that what we're doing is actually correct. And that's hugely important. The worst case scenario is that you think you're doing something right, but you're not doing it right, and this will lead to a nasty letter from the editor of a journal to your supervisor that says, this paper has to be retracted because the data was wrong. You never, ever want to be in that situation. So validating things and making sure what you're doing is correct is the most important thing that you, that you have to do. The complexities of actually getting things right, especially in bioinformatics, are actually huge, as you know, and as we'll encounter in this workshop. 
So taking things slowly, working through things step by step allows you to validate through every single step whether what you're doing is what you think you ought to be doing or what you think ought to be happening. And that's really important. The, the other thing is, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we would have still discussed what is the best language to learn for bioinformatics or what is the best language to use to do this. Well, nowadays, we, we don't do that anymore. We realize sometimes we need to program and compile code in C++. It just has to fly. So we need a fast compiled language, C++. Or we have to contribute to a large enterprise scale project. So unfortunately, we'll have to write some Java code. Or we're collaborating with people um, who are working in Python. So we start writing some Python code. Or we're doing you know, the fun data science anal analysis and machine learning and, and mangling your data. And that's where R really shines. So, there are different languages that are good for doing different things. And we kind of have to be able to read all of them, understand them. Usually, we all have a favorite computer language that we go to for our everyday tasks. But really, the, the particularities of the language, we should be agnostic to that. Now, that means if we write in a language that, and write very, very idiomatic code, our code is locked in. People who have very little R experience but come from Python might have problems understanding R code. These people might be your summer students who can't read your code, who, who are learners. It's like if I go to an international conference and I say something like, um, this came out of left field or um, any other of the many, many North American baseball idioms, I'm likely not to be understood because idiomatic use of language is nice and is elegant if you want to write a novel. But it's not very good for sharing information. So the subset that we use here is actually very similar to the same code that you would write in Python, for example. Some syntax differences, but it's probably really, really easy to take it command by command, expression by con expression, and simply translate from R to Python. So this is one of the goals here. Um, making things slow, making it explicit, not being too idiomatic, not using all of the possible shortcuts that, that R provides, and uh, being very, very explicit about it. That's actually a supremely important part of software development. If you want it to work, make things explicit. Translate implicit knowledge into explicit knowledge. Um, so the way that we'll proceed here is we'll define a couple of tasks, like mini projects. And I'm not even going to tell you how to solve them. You solve them on your own. I'm sorry. That's the way life works. Nobody is ever going to tell you how to do things. Well, at least not in a sustainable fashion. If, if, I, if I just show you code that works, you'll maybe learn a little bit. But once you step out the door, it's going to be very difficult to adapt this to the kind of code that uh, you actually need to run at home. So we'll focus on problem-solving strategies on how to find answers and how to <coughs> implement them. Um, there's four little mini-projects here. Not all of them are on the, uh, on the GitHub project yet. But um, in principle, um, we'll be working on simple sequence analysis first. Uh, we'll go through um, a larger project of data integration. We'll work with numeric data, in particular um, uh, protein structure data, and we'll be using some of the bioconductor tools to round it off. So <coughs> these tasks are all contained in various R scripts, and we may update them or actually I'm, I'm sure we will update them during the script. And that's actually very easy. This is a great paradigm to share work. The R project lives on GitHub, which is a publicly accessible site. Um, GitHub also offers private spaces if you need to share confidential work um, with collaborators. Um, but you need to pay for these. 
The public sites are free and they're accessible by everybody. So you download projects from GitHub. If you own the project, you make your changes locally, you commit them to, uh, to Git, and then you upload the changes to your master copy. Once your collaborators or the people in your class then download this, all of the new updates are shared into the, into the project. So I make changes, I upload them to GitHub, you pull the new version of the project from GitHub and you have the updated files. Now there's a caveat to that. If you edit R scripts that I edit too, your edits will be overwritten. And that's not good. Because what you really have to do during these workshops is take lots and lots of notes and write things and comments and code experiments and all of that. And if these would be overwritten every time I, I, I update a project, um, you, that, <laughs> you would be rightly very un, unhappy with me. So what the init function does when you run it, I've written it in a way um, where it takes the R files that we will be working with and makes a local copy for you. So that f these files are called my something something. For example, my data integration, my intro notes, my sequence analysis. So these are derived from data integration or um, sequence analysis.r. These are the project files that I've created, but these my whatever files are the files that you actually work with. You edit them, you put your code experiments into them, they're not going to be overwritten because they don't actually exist on GitHub. They only exist locally. So they don't get overwritten. So <coughs> save these files, but don't commit them to version control because that will create a conflict. Now, keeping a journal is supremely important for this. The important things that you take home are not the scripts. The important things that you take home are concepts, ideas, attitudes, little tricks that we've talked about um, that are not obvious that you won't easily find with a Google search. And these are things you write down as notes. So write as much as you can. You have notepads. Maybe some of you have really gone out and got themselves a nice journal for writing their, their important uh, workshop diary. Um, so code examples, task annotations go into these my whatever files, but concepts are much better paraphrased and then handwritten in your journal. And you will find that this dramatically improves your focus and your understanding. When I've, I go to a lecture, I always, you know, as the lecture goes along, I'm writing. Um, at the end of the lecture, I may never look at these notes again. But if I don't do that, a day after I walk out the door, I've forgotten what the lecture was about. If I write it down, that doesn't happen. It's, I, I don't know, maybe this is just me. Uh, maybe it's your experience too. If you've never tried it, try it in this workshop and maybe you'll discover something new and very, very valuable. So let's have a brief look at what's in the box here, what, what we have in the, in the files folder. <coughs> so these, these top files here are um, files that um, work internally. Um, our profile is the first file that gets loaded when the program starts. Init.r is a file that actually um, initializes your session. There's a reason why I don't initialize through our profile, um, which is a bit technical. There's a folder for old materials. The workshop that I'm teaching this time is completely redesigned from everything I've ever done before. Uh, in particular, we've, we've in the past worked a lot with just going through code scripts and explaining scripts. Um, I'm not sure that's the best way to learn. There's a, there's a place for that, um, but I think what we need in this introductory uh, tutorial is more um, things that you do yourself. So I've completely changed this. There's a folder with assets, 
which actually just contains uh, a PDF which we might discuss later. Um, there's a folder with data, which has some data files which, which I'm providing. Some of these overlap with files that I actually want you to download. So we can use the ones that exist in this folder as a backup, but um, some of the files I'd rather like you to discover where they live and, and how to get them from the web. Um, these two files are the source files for um, the R units we'll be working with. Um, this file called function template. Um, if you write your own functions, here's a template on how you can do this. And we'll go through that later. I, th I think we'll, we'll have a task of putting a, a function into this function template. Uh, it includes headers that describe what the function do, uh, what the parameters are, what the resulting values is, and so on. Similarly, there's a file called script template, which looks very similar, but is kind of a template that can get you started on working through um, code in your own projects at home in a systematic fashion. Um, there's a folder R. Um, typically, the folders simply called R contain R functions that um, have some use in your project that you've written for your particular project. There's a folder called sample solutions. Don't touch that. <laughs> this has my sample solutions. Um, but you're not going to need that because you will write these solutions on your own. You don't need my stuff here. So this is just for me to check back if I get confused and don't know what I'm doing. Um, and there's a folder called tests, and we'll, test, we'll, we'll uh, discuss a little later um, about how to test for correctness in your codes. So our first step is going to work with uh, simple sequence analysis. So what I'd like you to do is to open the file my sequence analysis. And this will allow us to recapitulate um, ideas that we have encountered in the preparatory workshop and extend them a little bit. Now, in particular, <coughs> we will download 100,000 nucleotides from human chromosome 20. If, if I do a kind of genome annotation practice work, I like to work with chromosome 20. It's plain vanilla chromosome, not one of the largest ones, uh, has about 500 genes, so it's, it's kind of manageable, not, not one of the big ones. So let's consider these 100,000 uh, nucleotides from the human chromosome, and let's figure out the dinucleotide frequencies, and consider whether the dinucleotide frequencies are <coughs> random. And at the end, we want to come up with a plot that kind of looks like this. So we if you source this command here, this is the plot we'll be having at the end. It's a dinucleotide frequency plot. We have the dinucleotides here. We've sorted them by frequency. We have the frequencies computed. We have observed and we have expected frequencies. And um, that's what we will end up uh, after this little uh, tutorial. So, of course, if we want to do something like that, um, we start with reading the data. So this is our first task. Find a source to download nucleotides 58,815,001 to 58,915,000 from the HG38 assembly of chromosome 20. So what's HG38? Yeah, who, who uses this identifier? Do you know where it comes from? NCBI? Uh, not really. This is from UCSC. UCSC has 
uh, the assemblies as HG38. Do you know what the previous assembly was at UCSC? 19, HG19. So why did it go from HG19 to HG38? The thing is, there's um, <clears throat> the human genome, uh, there's actually a human genome reference uh, consortium that makes, that updates the human genome assembly. It's a project that's still in flux. Um, but the, the reference assemblies have gone through many, many different stages, and the prior version uh, used to be GRCH37. Um, I will need to erase this. We'll need to re recreate it, but I need the space. Sorry. previous assembly was GRCH37, <clears throat> and UCSC, who've done fabulously uh, important work um, in integrating genomes and, and making the data available and making the data visible, um, have also gone through different iterations of their internal data, and the corresponding one is HG19. And people always got confused, why is 119, why is 137? So the next iteration, the currently current uh, human genome version is uh, GRCH38. And this corresponds to HG38. Is there a better marker? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so we would like HG thirty eight of chromosome twenty. Um, we want a source for particular nucleotides. We want to download them. We want to have them on our computer. Um, so how do we do that? How do we do that? Any suggestions? Where do we find nucleotide data? On the web. Not with R. We're not even using R yet, except to take notes. NCBI, NCBI is one source. UCSC is another source. Ensemble is a third source. So which one should we use? OK. So let's spend. It may matter. Because <clears throat> there's, the difference is um, that <coughs> they all have the same data. But it may be easier or more difficult to actually get the data from there and to get the data in a programmatic way. So why don't we spend like a minute and randomly either choose UCSC or NCBI or Ensemble at the EBI and try to just, you know, try for one and a half minutes to get that requested data. See how far you get.
Okay, was anybody actually able to access the data? Wow. It's amazing. You know, if you have a room full of smart people, uh, lots of things can happen. So, uh, Tammy, what did you do? I went to UCSC. Okay. And I put in the coordinates that you gave. Okay. What's the UCSC genome browser URL again? Genome.ucsc. Yay. Okay. So you clicked on genome browser? And by default, we have GRC H38, HC30. Something like this. Almost. <laughs> okay. need to download it, right? Uh, I, I guess like for what I do, I usually copy paste. <laughs> but so for this name, it's not the best way. This probably would work with copy and paste. Uh, Try save as. 
but we'll try save as. File, save as. And it says page source or web archive. Ooh. This is almost what we want, except it's in an HTML page, and we would need to edit it to do that. So if you do this only once, you're done. You can, you can edit this and then save it in the way that we want. But isn't there a way that we can download it as a text-only file without tags at the end and, and where we actually have to edit the file, which might be you know, somewhat onerous if you're actually downloading a whole 100 megabyte chromosome. Um, so that's the point at where I said, hmm, maybe UCSC is not the best solution for that. Um, any luck with something different? with something different. I was trying to the bioconductor, but I was like, <coughs> I could not select the, I, can't, I don't know how to select the, the position. Right. There, there are ways to do this in bioconductor, automatically connect with the databases. But um, I'm, I'm kind of partial to the to ensemble. Uh, I think the ensemble tools generally are, of all the tools that, that are out there, the most um, built with a philosophy to support programming and, and APIs and programmatic interfaces. So in, in general, if I need to solve something with a, with a script, if I have to look at something just you know, on the web, um, NCBI is fine, UCSC is fine. Uh, UCSC is actually very good, very rich. Um, but if I have to do anything with programming, Usually I, I get where I need to be faster with, with Ensemble. <coughs> so let's try Ensemble. Ensemble.org. Um, Ensemble.org takes me to a local mirror, US East Ensemble.org. Um, we can search human for this thing. That all looks very, very similar so far. In the top window, we have the genomic region overview. In the lower window, we have <coughs> the details of the 100,000 nucleotides we uh, requested. And we can click on export data. <coughs> And the output should be a fast A sequence. Uh, the location is given here. We can um, we can refine it if we need to. We can request five prime and three prime flanking sequence if we if we want any. Um, we want genomic unmasked. We don't want repeats or anything masked. We actually want the one hundred thousand nucleotides that we're asking for. Now we can choose whether we want HTML or text, and we can even get compressed text if we're looking for a very large file. <coughs> and now we have that. And if we download that one now, um, this is the file. 
th this is an actual text file. So let's 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 download this. Uh, we want to name the file chromosome twenty one hundred kilo base pairs and download it as a FASTA file. And it appears here. And that actually is the actual nucleotide file. So far, so good. What format is this? Sequences come in many different formats. <coughs> this is a FASTA file format. FASTA is, is kind of the workhorse of, um, of sequence files. It's a human readable format, which is good if you want to check and, if, and perhaps even edit things. Um, how is it defined? You, you kind of you know, look at it and you intuitively get an understanding of how the file is structured, but how is FASTA defined? Because that's really important. If we want to write code that reads and perhaps even produces FASTA files, um, we have to understand not just you know, what types of files we commonly encounter, but um, what the actual specification for the format is. <coughs> So if I ask a question like, how is this defined, and you don't know, where can you find the information? Google for it. So Google for it. Where do you find information on FASTA specifications? And Google tells me there is a FASTA format Wikipedia page, which explains the format, has examples, and so on. So <clears throat> make this a habit. If I say something that you're not familiar with, raise your hand and ask what it's about, um, or Google for it, or find the information. You have to be active information finders, especially in this workshop. Now, th there are, in fact, historically, different versions of FASTA. The canonical way of using FASTA files today um, specify that there is one and only one header line. This one and only one header line is the first line of the file. This first line of the file begins with a greater than sign or an, a closing angle bracket. And it has text data of any kind of text, probably assuming ASCII text, not Unicode text, because that's formatted differently. OK. Right. So we went to the ensemble page of chromosome 20 with the requested coordinates. You, you might have to go through that all again. Okay, we'll go through that again. Yes, one more time. <laughs> we'll go through that again. Okay, so, so we go to ensemble. On ensemble, there's a search field. We select human as the species we want to search with. And below that, we paste 
the coordinates that we're looking for. They kindly give us a, a formatting example. So this is chromosome 5, ba 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 bum and rat. This is human chromosome 20, 58 million, 815,001 to whatever. That's something I can type into my notes. Go to ensemble.org, um, select human, paste. the coordinates we need. And click on go. That takes me to the, the ensemble uh, browser for the region. Now, if I click on export data, I get all of this verified again. So the location to export, GRCH38, the output is a fast A sequence, the location is this, and so on, and we want genomic unmasked. Once we're there, we click on Next, choose the output format, in this case text. Right, but then you have to uncompress it locally. Okay. Right, because then it's a compressed archive. So if you click on text and you get the region, and then using my browser's save as function, I download it to my project directory and call it chr20-100kbp.fasta. Typically, your browser will contain at that point, me, 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 this is, do you want to call it FASTA? It has to be a text, or me, 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 it's, it looks like it's an HTML page, so call it HTML. I don't know why they do that. Mm -hmm. If I tell it to name it FASTA, please, then just do that. But you might have to rename the file later if it doesn't arrive in the right way. Yes. So the end result has to be, you have a file called chr 2100 kbpfastA in your local project directory containing these nucleotides. So the question is, the chromosome 20 is actually 100 kilobase pairs or are you selecting a portion of it? This is a small portion. Chromosome 20 is uh, 10, 10 megabases or something like that. So it's just a very small portion. Oh, actually, you know, we, we, we can see where we are here. <coughs> so if you have this downloaded, can you please put up your blue sticky notes so we know what we have the blue Right. Um, so this is the entirety of chromosome 20, and we're, we're picking out this little subregion here, which is 100 kbp.
So I think we have data. Usually that's the, the most troubling step. Once the data is on the computer, we're, we're safe. We can massage it. Um, getting the data from the web into your project directories is often um, much more involved than you'd like it to be. So we're going through a, f th through a few examples here just, just to practice that step. Now, we said this is a FASTA format. Um, we briefly, I briefly mentioned how this is uh, specified and defined. There's a first line, which is a header line, which has header information. And after that, we have sequence in one letter code. This is nucleotide sequence. Um, we know because it looks like nucleotide sequence. Um, this is not alanine, glycine, threonine, alanine, and so on, and cysteine. Um, but sometimes nucleotide sequence and, and protein sequence can be ambiguous. So that's one of the downsides of the FASTA file. It doesn't require semantics. It doesn't require people to specify whether this is nucleotide sequence or protein sequence. Typically, we, we recognize our, our four uh, bases, but there are also ambiguity codes. So for examples, we can have R for pyrimidine bases, or W for uh, bases that form two hydrogen bonds, and so on. You see that in this case, everything is uppercase. FASTA format also allows lowercase. And there's, in principle, one special character that is also allowed and often used in a FASTA format, which is the hyphen, which is simply denoting a gap. That's really important if you store aligned sequences in a FASTA file. And when you store aligned sequences, often you put more than one sequence into the same file. This is something then that we actually call a multi-FASTA file. This, also, this is also something you'll encounter uh, quite frequently. So the file can contain more than one sequence. And in that case, it would have more than one header line. And each sequence would start um, uh, with this one header line. All right, so now that we have that, um, the obvious next thing is to read this data into R, right? So how do we do this? It's a text file, and we want to read this information into R. Any suggestions? Read. Okay. <clears throat> so on your console, just type read. 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 And you will notice that there are many, 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 many different versions of read. Sorry, I should really unload some packages here. There's a read.csv, there's a read.dlim, there's a read fwf, read bin for character, uh, for binary, read character. Um, so which one would you use? How would you find out which one to use? Uh, 
eight? Well, R's help function. Um, so for example, we could type question mark, question mark, we. This will give us information on many, many, many different R pages that all contain something about reading. In particular, um, information from other packages, which are loaded and available for R. So in, in, with something very generic like read, this may not be as useful. Um, Could you just like hover over the reads and then check the information for each one and select the one that fits best for you? Right. So we can do that. Read.csv reads a file in table format and creates a data frame from it with cases corresponding to lines and variables to fields in the file. So read.csv is something that um, takes a file name parameter and then as a separator for elements uses commas. This is a format that we use very frequently. CSV is for comma separated values. Or for example, read delim. It's basically the same description. File, uh, now here the separator is backslash t. What's backslash t? That's a special character, it's a tab, right? So these are files that are tab separated. Often we store them as .tsv files, tab separated values. So csv files, tsv files are files that, that we encounter often. But we don't have separated values here. We just have texts, lines of texts. So as Pascaline said, we scroll down and, and look and you know, read binary. No, this is not binary data. Read character. Well, no, actually, read character. We might be able to make this work, but it's actually uh, for reading single characters from, from a text connection, something like, like reading input. Ignore read FASTA because that's a function I defined. Read lines, read some or all text lines from a connection. That kind of sounds like something we want to do. All the text in a file. So we define a file or, or a text connection um, and then um, continue from there. Let's see if Google agrees. read text file into R. Read CSV, read text. This is a different package. Data import and so on. Anyway, if we, if we browse along that, we will find a number of different uh, solutions. Now, let's use read lines. Um, our file name is CH20.100 KBP. Sure. So when you're looking for a command for a um, so when you're looking for a function, it'll automatically complete for you. Mm -hmm. But when you go to put your file name, it, you can't set it up to do that, where it'll sort of automatically give you the options of your files. Um, I, I wish I've never. Maybe there is a way. I don't know. Does it? Does yeah. it do that? Yeah. If you do. I, I think if you do readline. File 
So read lines. Or I think in this case it's con equals. And then try chr tab. Oh. So it's suggesting based on files. <coughs> you see it? Okay. I didn't know that. That's so useful. Oh, it, it, it basically also works in any kind of text string. Yeah. Right? Now, if we simply execute that command, though, um, all this will do is it'll take the file, open it, and dump it onto the console. That's not what we want to do. We actually want to assign it to something. So let's assign it to something. Let's just call TMP and assign to read lines. And let's have a look at what we get. Okay, now we've, we've assigned this to a variable. What's the next thing we need to do? Right. The next thing we always need to do after we read something is we need to check whether what we have is what we expect. So what would you check? Right, but what? What, what? what would you want to know about it? File name, whether the sequence is there. Whether the sequence is there and whether it's complete. Right? So if we look into the environment pane, this variable TMP has been created. It's a character vector. Um, it has 1,670 elements. It kind of shows me what the first element looks like, but we'll look at that in a little more, in a little more detail. So from that, that kind of looks correct. We have a vector, we have uh, 1670 elements, each element in that vector is going to be um, a piece of text. So an important command to, to use is um, head and tail. So head gives us by default the first six lines of a vector or a data frame or a matrix. And that shows the first line as expected is the header line and then we have text going on. What was that other command that I just mentioned to get the end of the line? Tail. <clears throat> yeah. 
So tail shows me that you might have noticed the other line does not actually, the last line actually did not extend to the end of the screen, so that's, that's good. Um, there's two extra empty lines here which don't bother us, but we'll need to be aware of that once we actually do something with the file that there might be empty lines. So that all looks from there. Uh, that, that all looks good. Um, so this is a vector. Let's recapitulate a little bit what we know about vectors. Value. Right. So <clears throat> there's a number of different categories. There's data, which are tables like data frames or lists or more complex object. There are values. Uh, these are um, assigned variables. So basically vectors or, or scalars or, or single variables. Um, and there's a section of functions which have been locally defined. And I still have a lot of stuff into, in my workspace. I'll, I'll clear that out during the coffee break, but, but you, you sh I don't have any of that. So under the values category, you find the variable name TMP and the information about TMP. Let's say we want to see only the first three lines of TMP. Head gives us six. We only want the first three. How can we do that? That's one possibility. Head takes extra arguments. So if we give it the number of lines that we want to see here, for example, three, we get the first three. But more generically, this is a vector. How do we get the first three elements from a vector? You can use like square brackets and then go one and pull the three. Right. We can, we can do this. And get the three. Now this is very flexible. <coughs> Remember there's different ways to access information from a vector. One is by explicitly specifying numbers, like a range, like one, two, one, two three, or um, one, three, five, seven. or one, two, three, but in reverse order. And so on. So we can access this in, 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 many, in, in, in many different ways uh, as a vector. <coughs> now, is this a convenient way to keep the data? Or what's the best way to keep the data? Now, when I ask about what's the best way to do something, that's a loaded question. Because the answer is always, yeah, best for what? What do we actually want to do with it? When we define what we want to do with it, it's often clear how to store something or how to operate with it. Before you do that, it's, it's really an ill-posed question. So without specifying, what we want to do with the data, um, <coughs> this format of keeping it in memory is as good as any other, because all the data is there. 
It's not particularly inefficient. It's just not easy to use for particular tasks. So what tasks could we be interested in doing? With a, with a sequence file, in principle. Finding short strings of sequence? Finding short strings of sequence, for example. Finding substrings. What else could we want to do? GC content. Calculating GC contents. What else? Variance. Hmm? Variance. Looking for variance. Variance. What else? Finding particular positions, for example. Finding dinucleotides. So <clears throat> all of these have slightly different um, pros and cons for different formats. In principle, there are two competing ideas. One idea is to put everything into a single string one word of 100,000 characters. And that's useful, for example, to find substrings, because we can apply so-called regular expressions to that. Regular expressions are a very powerful and versatile way of finding patterns in sequences. We'll encounter regular expressions later on. Be forewarned. They're a bit um, salty but extremely useful. So this is why we can't avoid regular expressions. Now, if we look for a pattern like GAATTC, a format like this is really not good because our GAATTC might break across a line. And if it does that, we wouldn't find it in any of the lines of characters. So this is why, in that case, keeping everything in a single word is much preferred. But if we have everything in a single word, how do we calculate GC contents? How do we count the number of Gs in, in a string like this? Not easy. In that case, it is better to break the string apart, break the sequence apart into a vector that has one character per element. So a vector of length 100,000 elements and <coughs> keeping every, every element uh, separately. And then it becomes relatively easy to count single nucleotides or dinucleotides and so on. So that's what we'll do. And um, for that, we will we will write a function that takes a file name as an argument and returns the sequence as a vector with one character per element. We will write a function to read FASTA files. So it takes the file name as an argument and returns the sequence as a vector with one character per element. Um, <coughs> a good thing to do here would be to open the function template and edit that. So we'll call this read fasta.r and we will save it as read fasta.r. So we have a local copy. Okay, so do that. Open the function template, build yourself, uh, save it as read fasta.r, and then um, we'll work on that. 
So the general description is read a fast a sequence file. The author is you. I'm a little bit obsessive about keeping header files intact um, and actually adding the information. You might think initially, ah, I'm never going to use that and I'm never going to, to, uh, um, to share this with anybody or, or um, it's just, it just doesn't matter. I can just dump the code into a file and it'll work just as well. Well, in principle, you may be right. But things like that have a habit of progressing and accumulating more code and accumulating more intelligent things, especially if you use them in a project and reuse them. So if you start yourself out doing things with a clear header and a clear definition and clear comments everywhere, you'll do yourself a favor. And you'll do that person who's very dear to your heart um, a favor, which is you yourself half a year from now when you need to re visit that code, and you'll just throw up your hands and disgust and say, whatever was I thinking at that time, I have no idea what this code is and does, and you'll need to rewrite it because it wasn't commented or you don't know what the value is or, or whatever. So keep these things structured. It's a really, really useful habit. It'll save you a lot of time in the end. And it also helps you thinking somewhat systematically about the code, which is also really important. So the date. <clears throat> Today is the 14th, is it? Yeah. yeah. That's the way I write dates, and that's the only way I write dates. Why? There's a beautiful cartoon, you know, a boy and a girl standing together, and the girl asks the boy, what's your idea of a good date? And he answers, uh, year, month, day. Everything else confuses me. So why this way? Universal. Universal, yes. That's always good, especially in these times. Um, but there's actually a functional reason for writing it this way. Right, if you sort things according to dates in this format, if you sort them by text, um, it will be sorted chronologically. So this is why this format is useful. <clears throat> okay, now the function would be read fast a function parameters um, we said we'll use only one a file name purpose is describe um, read a fast a file return a vector of single letters. We might refine that. We might not allow every, lect every letter, but right now that's, that's all we'll do at the... Um, sequence letters. The parameters are fn, which is a character constant, which is file name of the input file. The value is what the function returns. <coughs> Our functions return at most one value. They don't have to return any value. 
Some R functions are invoked for so-called side effects. Something like printing something to screen or um, making a plot or um, <coughs> changing something in the global environment. These are side effects. But pure R functions return a value and do not touch anything else anywhere. R is what is called a functional language, and functional languages work really, really well if you write your functions so they don't have side effects. In particular, we never change values outside of the function. That's, if you ever do find yourself doing that, don't. It's a really, really bad habit. You could, but you shouldn't. So change only values locally, and anything that, that comes in as a result um, is returned as a single value. Now. Of course, we have vectors. Are these single values? Yes, a vector is a single value. But what happens if we want a vector and annotation and um, maybe another function? Three different, very, very different things. Well, in that case, you can just combine everything that the function ought to return together in a list and return one list. So in principle, R functions return only one object, but the object can be arbitrarily complex. In this case, the one value we return is um, character vector um, single letters of the last A sequence. And in the details, I, I describe some limitations. Um, for example, um, we discard the header, which we might not want to do later on. We might want to store the, let the header somewhere with our vector. Then we add the code, and we return the result of what Ever the result is. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. R functions by default return the last expression or the result of the last expression that was evaluated in the function before it arrives at the bottom of the square bracket. And many people write that way. I think this is very poor practice. The R functions that I write always return their results explicitly. It simply makes it easier to read the function and figure out what's going on. You don't just fall through through the end and then mysteriously the value arrives. You explicitly return the value. Um, other programming languages also require you to explicitly return values, so I don't see any benefit in, in doing it the idiomatic way in R. Um, on the contrary, it becomes harder to read um, is possibly prone to misunderstandings, um, possibly harder to maintain. There are two other sections that I have in my function template. One is examples and one is tests. And we'll get to these a little later on in more detail. Um, <clears throat> now these are in conditional blocks. And the block is if false, then do something. So what does, what does this conditional block do? What does a block like that do? So that's you avoid repeating yourself, like downloading maybe packages or something? Mm, yeah, let's, let's not think about why we do that. Just tell me now, what does it do? If I execute this block, it does. If it fails, then it, you could tell it to put an error message up or something like that? Um, like reading the FASTA file? No. So this is a conditional statement. Conditional statements work. They start with an if, then there's a condition, and then there's a block of expressions. If the condition is true, the block of expressions is evaluated. If the condition is false, the block of expressions is not evaluated. So 
So what's this condition here? It's false. It's unconditionally false. It's always false. Because I've defined it, false. It says right there, false. So if false does nothing. This block skips everything that's within the curly brackets. Why in the world would we do that? Well, the reason is, <clears throat> if we have a function template like that, we can simply source the entire thing and then load the function. But we also want some additional information, for example, information of how to use it or tests that we don't want to execute every time we source the function. So we put these in a separate block that is not actually executed. So when we source this piece of code, we define the function, but we don't actually do anything in here. So here is where we then write our example code. If we manually go into the file, we can always select them and execute the commands in here to experiment with our examples or run the tests, change this to true, whatever. But the way we just write this function and then later on keep it in our uh, R directory to be automatically executed, we don't actually want anything to happen. We want to be able to source the thing and skip all of that. This is why we have a conditional block here that does nothing. All right. So the next thing to do is to write the code, or is it? No. We never start writing code. What we do instead when we develop any kind of functions is we break up what we want to do step by step and simply write it as comments into our code. So let's try to do that. We want a function that reads a file, breaks it apart, assigns it to a vector, and then returns the vector. So, first step is read the file. Second step Remember, it's a fast day file. Separate. Separate. Header. Let's discard the header. Discard the header. Then. So in our example here, we, <coughs> we start with a vector of 1,670 lines. Now after discarding the header, we have 1,669 lines. So what do we do with these? Make it into one line. We could. No, it's one word of a hundred thousand something characters. Create a vector. Hmm? Create a vector to a single Break it apart. Did we miss something? I, I don't know. I mean, this is a real question. I, I, this is not rhetorical. Did we miss something? 
I'm not sure. Greg, did we miss something? Looks good to me. You do it that way? I might do it a bit quicker. <laughs> Psst. Step by step. Step by step. <laughs> okay. So, time for a coffee break. After the coffee break, um, we'll actually implement this. But in principle, this is the template of our workflow to develop a function. We first of all vaguely define what it is supposed to do. Then we think about how to break this down step by single step. Then we write down our steps as something we often call pseudocode, like simple line by line instructions. And then we implement the single instructions. And then we verify that what we did is correct, and then we test, and we write tests, and so on. So there's more stuff to it. But this is the principle, and we'll follow that religiously for every single example here. This is the most important thing that I hope that you'll take home from this workshop. If you want to solve something, don't start writing R code. Writing code is the last step. But be absolutely clear on what you want your code to accomplish. 